In the name of the God of creation who loves us all, amen. Well, good morning and welcome to each of you as we continue our journey in this long green season of Pentecost. In today's Gospel from Matthew, we're reminded that some forms of wisdom cannot be obtained by working ourselves into a state of weariness. Knowledge of God, it seems, cannot always be achieved through excellence of effort or dent of perseverance. Now, I don't know about you all, but this perspective turns my normal ways of being and doing in the world upside down. Jesus has a way of doing this, of course, but it still catches me off guard. What might it mean if through hard work and our type A behavior, we sometimes miss the point Jesus is making and perhaps even the main purpose of our lives as Christians? Can I really reconcile this part of me with the need to become more childlike in my faith? And then in verses 28 through 30, we find those lovely invitations to which all of these passages have been building. Come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's a wonderful metaphor, really. The principle is that of bearing burdens with more efficiency. When Jesus worked as a carpenter, we're told he likely made yokes as a part of his day-to-day -day work. I like to imagine this. I find it comforting to think of him carefully shaping and fitting the yoke so that it would fit just right and bear the burden of the plow. Sometimes I imagine him sanding the rough spots, making it a perfect complement to the task at hand. I wish I could do this more often. Similarly, I like to think that Jesus knows each of us by name, knows our gifts and graces, our needs and our broken places. He doesn't want us to be so weighed down or so weary that we cannot bear the good work each of us has been called to do. Ron Rollheiser has reminded us that there are clear, distinct moments within the Paschal cycle, and we're in one of those now. Each is a part, he says, of transformation, of letting go and embracing so as to receive new life, new spirit. Good Friday challenges each of us to name our losses and our deaths. Easter asks of us that we claim our new births, our resurrections. The 40 days requires that we grieve what we've lost and adjust to the new. Ascension is letting go of the old and letting it bless us, and Pentecost, this blessedly long green season, is the receiving of the new spirit for the life that we are in fact now living. And so you see, friends, the Paschal mystery should set us free to mourn unrealistic expectations about our bodies, our relationships, our institutions, our families, and yes, even our churches. So in this sense, transformation is less about becoming someone or something new, which I think is largely a myth, and rather, in fact, becoming more authentically who we are, including the shadow parts of ourselves to which Paul alluded in the text we heard read just a moment ago, Parts of ourselves we may resist, may prefer to deny, may not even like very much. One of my dear mentors suggested that a primary task of our lives is to grieve appropriately, stay resilient, and embrace the new normal. We can stay stuck in our mistrust of change or let the spirit and her mischievousness as comforter, creator, renewer, uh, be our source of strength and wisdom. Our lives are filled with many Good Fridays, and the choice is ours whether those will be terminal, snuffing out life and spirit, or paschal, opening us up to the new. And we must not let fear of change keep us in bondage. 
As Roy Batty says at the end of what I think is an underappreciated film called Blade Runner, it's quite an experience to live in fear, isn't it? That's what it means to be a slave, he says. I wish I could say I've never been afraid of change and that this fear has never held me in bondage, but that would be a lie. When I was growing up, my maternal grandparents had a small farm in North Georgia. Some of you have heard me speak of it. It was a sanctuary for me, and my maternal grandmother, whose face I see when I imagine God, always welcomed me into that sacred space where it did not matter what my grades were or how many touchdowns I had or, perhaps more to the point, had not scored the Friday before. I was thinking about her again this week and about this story in light of today's text. Her love was unconditional. She created a beloved community around her I've sought to co-create ever since. And just as we come back again and again to the paschal life-giving stories of our lives, our loves and losses, our failures and triumphs, we return again and again to the deep narratives of our lives, those stories who make us who we are. And as we revisit them, we learn from them, and in so doing always, as one author said, we begin again. My relationship to scripture is like this, remembering, re-engaging, learning anew for each new season of life. And one of the outward and visible signs of my grandmother's love was her pound cake always waiting for me on the kitchen table with a cold glass of milk when I returned from the fields or the woods or the lake. When Vicki and I were in graduate school and our boys were very young and our family was just beginning, we visited the farm before heading back to Nashville to school and the lives we had so tenuously begun to co-create. My grandmother asked me to join her in the kitchen to bake pound cakes to take back to Tennessee, and curiously, she asked me to write down the recipe. I protested, reminding her that she knew it by heart, but she insisted. I obediently observed and wrote the steps and ingredients in her cookbook, a cookbook she later gave to me, and we wrapped the last pound cakes she ever made into wax paper and aluminum foil. Two weeks later, she was gone. I drove to the farm after her funeral brokenhearted and feeling alone. I could not imagine a world without her in it. And I saw the dining room table bereft of pound cake, and I felt afraid. And then I remembered the recipe and that last day with her, and I realized she must have known something and was giving it to me, and that it wasn't really even about the pound cake, but about the beloved community and the compassion and love which were her gifts to me, a load lighter for the love that bore it, a yoke less burdensome. And it was an invitation to move beyond that Good Friday moment to Easter and on to Pentecost to the gift of the Spirit and the life that I was already living with my wife and my two sons. I could live into the new reality and find grace and life abundant in that season, and she had given me, well, the recipe to do so through her love. I do so as Vicki and I approach our 35th wedding anniversary, remembering her, recalling, and now retelling that story to all of you as we have promised again for a new season in our lives and begun to think about next steps now as the grandparents of twins. And somehow I see my grandmother and the story I just shared with you through the new perspectives that these life cycle changes have provided. Somehow I see the grandfather I would become reflected in her eyes way back then, as if she could in her wisdom see me then as I am now and love that person too and the great 
great-great-grandchildren she would not live to see, and I am so very grateful for her. I imagine her as she was then handing me the pound cake as I am now, a grandfather myself. And in so doing, I understand in a new way how when we celebrate the Eucharist, we do so sharing in time and space that first Eucharist and this one today and all those to come. As if time in those moments is standing still, which in fact, in fact, it is doing. I hear Jesus' familiar and comforting words, yes, once again, but I am not the same person who heard this text before. I see new wisdom in a childlike faith and the apophatic not knowing it bespeaks or put slightly differently as Nobel laureate Bob Dylan said, I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. Each new day brings new fears that threaten to keep us in bondage, and in spite of this, remarkably, miraculously, Jesus tells us not to be afraid that he will give rest to our souls. We may not always be sure where we are going or even if we can keep on going, but then as our wonderful poet Wendell Berry said, it may be that when we no longer know what to do, we've come to our real work. And when we no longer know which way to go, we have begun our real journey. The mind that is not baffled is not employed. The impeded stream is the one that sings. Another wonderful poet, Seamus Haney, in his last words in this earthly life, which were written and not spoken from his hospital bed to his lifelong love and wife, Marie. Two words, Noli to Mary, don't be afraid. These were words of courage for his beloved at a moment when God was about to do a profoundly new thing that she did not fully perceive. Noli to Mary, fear not. Words of courage for us and for all of God's beloved uttered throughout Holy Scripture by prophets, poets, angels, and Jesus himself so many times. Whenever God is about to do some new thing, we are to be unafraid even in the face of that new thing we do not yet quite perceive, that new thing that will inevitably draw us from the security of the familiar because God has given to us Jesus and the Holy Spirit and one another to be the body of Christ working in our lives in this place here and now. This is the journey of the Paschal mystery, ending and beginning with Pentecost, ordinary time, and the hope of a yoke not so burdensome or scary. As the wonderful poet Mary Oliver has said, and what do I risk to tell you this, which is all that I know? Love yourself, then forget it, then love the world. Come to me, all you that are weary, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. We can do this hard thing, dear ones, whatever it is, after all, we have the recipe. Amen.